Hey friends, it's Melvin. Thanks for tuning into this episode. Here's just a few quick things I wanted to notify you guys about before we get started. First up, very soon, new episodes will be releasing Wednesday mornings rather than Tuesday. So don't panic if you don't see a new episode on Tuesday. Just wait a little longer and you'll see it in your feed. Second, we've introduced a mailbag. Check those show notes and toward the bottom you'll see a mailbag link. You'll then be able to text us any questions you might have about movies, the movie industry, or any movie slash Christian related questions you might have. Then we'll respond in a future episode, so send us your questions now. Up next, Patreon polls, which are available to Patreon supporters at the $3 tier or higher, have been updated. Supporters can now suggest films or shows to be reviewed at the end of each month. The two most liked submissions will become the options for the Patreon poll, so if you want to hear us talk about your favorite movie or show, join our Patreon and start campaigning. And lastly, whether you're a new or long-time listener, please consider writing a review or rating the Cinematic Doctrine podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Apart from financially supporting on Patreon, these are the two most helpful ways to support the show. And that's it. Enjoy the episode. You're listening to Cinematic Doctrine. Hey, so if you press play, you're missing out on 43 minutes of content. Uh, this content is exclusive to Patreon supporters only. So if you go to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine and you support for $3 a month, you get access to it. Uh, we talk about two different things here. Um, the first thing we talk about is this rumor that the uh, Russos will be coming out to uh, possibly do Avengers 5 and 6. Um, now that the Kang dynasty has become the Kang disaster, um, all thanks to a lot of really horrible stuff, frankly. And that combined with the fact that the Marvel films lately have been hit or miss as opposed to the consistent stride that they had from phase one through three um, has bloomed this rumor um, that has come out. And it's not just a rumor as in like somebody just talked about this and that, whatever, but sources uh, were able to confirm it with um, sources confirmed with journalists, but Marvel has not confirmed it yet. So we'll see what happens, but we spent some time talking about that and what we, what we think it could mean. Um, and then following that, we talk about um, how Gladiator was, and I still haven't figured out how to describe it, but they got review bombed on YouTube for the trailer. So dislike bombed, whatever. Uh, basically, the Gladiator trailer, Gladiator 2 trailer comes out, and uh, James Hibbard of Deadline observed that it had 133,000 likes and then uh, had 279,000 dislikes. So he was like, hmm, that's weird because this trailer's killing it everyone wants to see this movie what's going on so he learned that there were these three interesting reasons why across x and the youtube comment section why people are not liking the trailer um and we spend some time talking about those things and uh how the internet hasn't grown up yet and we're still waiting for it to get out of its diapers uh because people complain about the darndest things um so again support on patreon you get to hear some extra content uh 40 minutes there and then on every episode frankly for the last two and a half years three years we have been doing this where you get 40 20 to 40 minutes of extra content uh of all different kinds and it's not always time pressure so you can listen to older stuff and it'll be either a mini game trivia all kinds of fun stuff um, but you press play because you wanted to hear us talk about dream scenario we're going to be doing a movie discussion dream scenario came out last year 2023 uh from a director whose name i'm going to totally get wrong here christopher Oh, it's just, it's just Christopher, but in a different, <laughs> just from a different nationality. <laughs> Fooled, Christopher yeah. Borgley. Movie discussion formats are very simple. Uh, we talk about the film very generally about different topics, themes, how we felt about it. Um, the first half is no spoilers. Uh, so you'll be able to hear how we feel and vibe about the film and generally if we enjoyed it or not. And then the second half will be opened up spoilers uh, where we you know talk about the film however we want. Um, that transition kind of just happens. I'll announce it when it takes place, but it we, we kind of sometimes it's 20 minutes, sometimes it's 40 minutes. It just takes time and depending on how our conversation goes. Um, but I'm here with a guest and I wanted to make sure we have some time to talk about that. I'm here with Isaac from Infinity Bros. Um, what is going on, Isaac? Not much. I'm excited to be here and uh, chat dream scenario with you. A uh, big uh, Nicolas Cage fan, so this is uh, a very much interest to me. So, what what era of Nicolas Cage are you a fan of, or perhaps all of them? But like, what in particular? There are plenty <laughs> of them to choose from. So, uh, I guess my 
favorite era of Cage uh, films is probably his action movies. Oh, The Rock. The Rock. Con, Con Air. Air. So just some, cl- some classics in there. They yeah. just are so much fun. Face Off. Mm-hmm. Um, just goofy comedy uh, action films. And, and it's hard to find somebody who did that better than Nicolas Cage, who plays it straight in almost every film yes. that he does, uh, <laughs> which is so fun to watch. I, mm-hmm. I absolutely love it. And he's such a he's I've always been so fascinated with him because he's in so many movies and a lot of them are really, really not great movies. Mm-hmm. I just <laughs> find it so interesting that an actor of his caliber can be in those types of movies. But the guy um, loves a challenge and loves to take risks in his acting career. So that's what makes me love him so much. <laughs> yeah. You figure like he for a time fell into the like John Cusack red box movie era where like mm-hmm. he was just doing anything and you were, yeah. you would be like watching these movies thinking like, what did he lose a bat? Like, is, is he, <laughs> does he have debt or something that's going right. on? And then like, uh, he had Joe, which came out in 2011, uh, David Gordon green, which was kind of like a, mm, maybe Nicholas cage is back. And then a couple years later, I think some people like mom and dad, I did not like that movie at all. Um, and then that was kind of the beginning of his more art housey era where then, you know, Mandy of course came out and mm-hmm. blew everyone's mind. But but we'll talk about Nicolas Cage in a bit. I want to I want to <laughs> talk about your show. So Infinity Bros, mm-hmm. when I went to your website, I, I already knew you had a team, but like six people. That's crazy. So like, how'd you build this team? And and like I saw that like this is how it started, too, or at least mm-hmm. you had a lot of people at the beginning. Tell, yeah. tell me about Infinity Bros. Yeah. So the Infinity Gro- Bros are a group of the Infinity guys. Girls, Infinity girls. <laughs> <They're> coming out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> We, I mean, that's this is like the exact type of uh, joke that we would have on our podcast. Like making fun of each other is pretty much our bread and butter. So anytime somebody misspeaks, which we do all the time, we, there's like a five minute bit that happens right after that of us just ragging on each other. So, But the Infinity Bros are a group of six guys who. We all met in college and we just shared a love for specifically like superhero um, culture, Um, Mm -hmm. but also just film, TV, video games, just all the stuff that we love to consume and enjoy watching and doing together. And Mm -hmm. we were like, you know what? We're a bunch of guys that uh, have something to say, so we should start a podcast as as everybody does <laughs> as <you know>? men do <laughs> yes <laughs> but but when you listen to our podcast what we what we really try to bring out is just our the chemistry and the it, it feels like you're just hanging out with with a bunch of your friends when you listen mm-hmm. to our podcast so so that's what we try to to just bring forth and then just do it in a fun way of talking about recent things that are coming out like M- marvel and star wars is kind of our our bread and butter uh, mm-hmm. any recent releases of of those things we will cover for sure. But then if we're specifically into something, uh, you know, TV, especially we're reviewing the boys and a few other things that, you know, maybe are a little bit outside of that realm. We, we also kind of tag along with that too, kind of just go with the flow and whatever we are feeling about talking about um, that week. So, but yeah, we, we just have fun. We just have a good time. Um, one of my, co-host is also super into magic the gathering and yes <laughs> dragged the rest of us in with him and we are basically magic the gathering content creators as well so yes. so if you uh tag along <laughs> on our tiktok and instagram you'll see uh robbie does a ton of content on magic the gathering and we'll we'll play it together as a group and stream that as well on cool. Twitch and YouTube and, and things like that. So yeah, like a, like a six player commander game. <laughs> four, we, we generally stick to four. <laughs> okay. Six would be, be a like, lot. Bro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. But yeah. Like we, how many we just, days do you just... have? <laughs> <laughs> not enough, not enough. That's for sure. Uh, but yeah, we just like to have fun and, you know, get in, everybody else uh, in on the fun. That's cool. Uh, so with this year, you guys have covered just a, a ton of shows, uh, which listeners know I, 
I just can't get into shows. I, I'm <laughs> so much more of a movie guy because it's 90 minutes to two hours. And if I didn't like it, it's over. <laughs> sure. I, so, yeah. so, but you guys have covered Fallout, X-Men 97, Shogun, which of course is a huge highlight for a lot of people this yeah. year. And then Netflix's Avatar, which is a huge disappointment for a lot of people this year. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. What is your preference? Do you prefer to cover movies or shows? And then like, Ooh. what do you think has been like a, significant distinction between the two when you've been doing your show tv shows have really become our our main focus and that's more because they are easily accessible to all of us most of us are fathers of children (laughs) so Mm -hmm. when it comes to going to the movie theater it has become not as often as we'd like that we we used to, I mean, all of these Marvel (laughs) movies, we used to all go to them together. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, part of how we formed this like bond through, you know, nerd culture and then starting our podcast. Uh, But yeah, as we, as time has gone on, we're all, you know, fathers and, and have full-time jobs and, you know, stuff like that. As much as I wish this could be my full-time job. I unfortunately <laughs> do have another full-time job. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, but yeah, just with time constraints, films get to be tough. Sometimes we still do hit the big superhero movies uh, for sure. The once, maybe, maybe once all of our kids are in school, we'll be going to matinees together, you know, or something mm-hmm. like that. Who, who knows what the future holds, but TV shows really have become, kind of our our thing because they're just accessible if you got a streaming service boom you can watch a tv show and it's it's fun to you know look at how we were then and how far we've come and i you know i would love to say that we're professional podcasters but that's definitely not the case (laughs) uh we we still you know are doing this just for the fun of it Mm -hmm. and as long as we keep enjoying it we're just going to keep doing it Hey, don't forget, there's a lot of fun content missing from this episode because you're not listening on Patreon. Head over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine and support for $3 a month to gain access to uncut episodes with upwards of 40 minutes of bonus content each. You'll thank me later. That's right. We're doing an episode on Dream Scenario. So so just to, to pull back to the introduction again, Dream Scenario 2023 uh, film came out last year. It was one that was people were really anticipating. Uh, Nick, as as stated, Nicolas Cage is in like a um, his like third or fourth renaissance at this point. People forget he's been around forever <laughs> and, he, and that he has an Oscar. Um, mm-hmm. But that like, yeah, he, this guy is a um, seasoned actor. Um, he has been around the block. And so when people saw that this film was essentially it, it, the premise is people are having dreams of, a, of the same person and the person is real and the person is named paul matthews and the char- the actor who plays paul matthews is nicholas cage so you're seeing this trailer and you're just thinking everyone's dreaming of nicholas cage yeah i'll go see that so like <laughs> great great casting right off the bat um the premise itself is interesting the trailer kind of shows him like Ha- shows versions of himself interacting with other people and dreams. There's like violent dreams. It looks like there's like a romantic one. There's boring dreams. And so you're like, okay, it'll be interesting to see the drama that takes place where like this kind of normal looking dude with a receding hairline is appearing in people's dreams. And how are they going to react to that? The movie kind of came and went. Um, it was like a movie that I feel like I remember seeing a lot online, people being excited for talking about. And then it came out. And then I just didn't hear anything else about the film. And so here we are bringing it back, bringing it back from the dead um, to talk about it. Before I share my thoughts, I want to hear your thoughts. Isaac, what did you think of Dream Scenario? What I will say initially is that Nicolas Cage and A24 is a match made in heaven. Mm -hmm. Dude was made to create movies with these indie studios, which I mean, a 24, can you even consider them an indie studio anywhere? Like they've been putting out hits left and right in the yeah. past, like five years, um, you know, and everything everywhere all at once won a ton of Oscars. So yes. yeah, I don't even know if you can consider them an indie studio anymore, but what they do is they create very original stories and movies 
and Nicolas Cage is born to play these weird, wacky, yeah. outside of the box roles. Yeah. So initially coming into it, I was like, let's go. I'm very excited for this film. And the trailer did a really great job at making you intrigued without giving away anything. You know, I, I was like, yeah, Nicolas Cage in a bunch of dreams. Sounds great. OK, what the heck, <laughs> what the heck is this about? So I, I thought it was a it was a very fascinating film. It was I, I don't even really want to say great because <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> it was so different in, in just out there. But it was very interesting to watch. If you're an A24 yes. fan or a Nicolas Cage fan, this is going to move, be a movie that you probably need to see. Outside of that, I would probably hold back on recommending it to people. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is a... Um, like the verbal processing that I'm hearing is also like how I'm feeling like it is a movie that like I was super interested in seeing and then, you know, I got busy. I didn't go see it, but like, uh, I, from, from the first trailer, from the first marketing, cause I remember seeing about this, I think before, before it really got its full marketing with the trailers, like it just, it just, it sounds right. Right. Like from a distance, if I heard that song, I'd go, that's the song I want to listen to. Mm-hmm. But then I got closer and I'm like, Oh, <laughs> I don't know if I want to <laughs> like, yeah. it just doesn't sound right anymore. And mm-hmm. like, yeah, there, I kind of like process the film as like the beginning to me was like, all these pieces are really interesting. I like the high concept nature of the film. It's very simple and easy and I'm interested to see where it goes. And like that, that to me reminded me of like uh, a couple of years ago, Danny Boyle directed Yesterday, which was about a man who hits his head, wakes up in a world where the Beatles didn't exist, but he remembers them. The trailer showed like, what if he then starts playing, making Beatles songs like in this other world and he gets really popular. And so there's all these interesting things about it. But then like I saw Yesterday in theaters, it's like one of the first episodes we did on the podcast. It was kind of just a little less than okay. Like it was just (laughs) mostly interesting and occasionally pretty funny, but kind of like, eh. And uh, that to me just kind of came across like dream scenario was a little bit better than that, where it's really interesting Mm -hmm. concept uh, and beginning ideas were super interesting and compelling. But then like, as it kind of continues, it simultaneously gets better like there's a scene in the middle that's probably both the part where the movie's going to lose a lot of people but to me I actually found it to be a really good dramatic scene until it decided it wanted to be a funny scene we'll <laughs> talk about that later um but then like after that about 20 minutes later the last like 40 minutes completely lost me it like felt like it just goes off the rails it turns into a different movie i wouldn't say it's like sorry to bother you which is like a super absurd almost like kurt vonnegut like kind of movie super super uh not not super transgressive but just a a fairly offensive movie dream scenario never really gets that way but it just like it just totally lost me and then yeah the ending i just sort of felt like didn't it wasn't earned uh when it gets to this like ending that intends to be very emotional um, which again, we'll get into when we get into more spoilers. But yeah, to me, I just like I stepped away feeling like, well, at least we have a lot to talk about. Right. <laughs> so. It's it's really one of those <laughs> movies that like it's one of those movies that would get an actor or actress a nomination for an award, but the movie itself would not. Like, yeah. Oh, my Cage, gosh. Yes. <laughs> Cage does phenomenally. He do, he plays this role perfectly for this movie. Mm -hmm. But the movie itself is just not quite at the level that Cage is at. And yeah, to be fair, there are plenty of movies where Cage doesn't nail his role. Like it's not Mm -hmm. it's not like he's this far above everything that he does type of thing. But the movie itself just isn't up to par with his performance in the movie. His performance elevates this movie drastically Uh, i'm sure you noticed this too but didn't the movie feel like it started like a normal movie with this one weird thing Mm -hmm. everybody's dreaming about it and then 
turns into a, a not so normal movie where everything is weird. Like yeah. that's what it felt like. It just totally just, just, <laughs> I don't know. It just jumped yeah. the shark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely agree with you there. This, the ending was not satisfying at all. I think it started out very, very well. And what I'll say about the whole movie itself, it had these eerie undertones that just played yeah. perfectly to the type of movie that a 24 was trying to make it be. So I think overall it was, it was a, a solid watch for me personally. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I enjoyed it very much, especially just cages performance. Like I said, I mean, it elevates the, the whole film. It does. It does kind of go off the rails by the end. And by the end of it, you're just like, OK, I think I'm done watching this movie. <laughs> yeah, it it it's also like this film where like the beginning has all these interesting places to go. But by the time you get to the end, you realize you didn't get that far. Mm -hmm. um, like there's just not much else to it. Um, what what did you find that the movie kind of evoked in you or drew out like as you were watching it? Kind of the main theme that I, I kind of drew from this, I guess, is the feelings of like wanting to be wanted, um, I guess. And that, yeah. that's what Cage's character kind of goes through, who he feels like he's, I don't know if worthless is the right word, but he feels like he's not important. And throughout the movie, uh, he feels more and more important. And in the end, you know, it doesn't turn out the way that he wanted it to mm -hmm. um and and we'll get into that probably a little bit more in in spoiler territory but just uh the feelings of like emptiness i guess and you know actually kind of some interesting parallels is going to ecclesiastes in in the bible is like you strive to attain everything you strive to like get everything that you want mm -hmm. and then when you get it doesn't completely satisfy you it, like you don't really feel the way you thought that you'd feel when you have it mm -hmm. so that was that was kind of the vibes that i got from this movie is like not being satisfied you know emptiness or or whatever especially from from cage's character totally um so like it's in the title dream scenario mm -hmm. and like what are dreams like they are these dream, dreams are um, whispers from the deep as uh, Paul Trades would. Well, I guess Paul didn't tell us that, but <laughs> the guy with the gargly voice did, the sound <laughs> card did. but um, you know, I, my time at the, um, well, you don't know this listeners know I was an impatient, but like my time at impatient, they did a lot of talking about like psychology and stuff like that. And they said, and, and like the prevailing read of dreams in like the psych world is that like dreams are like abstract expressions and explorations of desires and fears and so like if you're and and they are also com um, something impacted by emotional state or even physical because if you're actually just physically too hot you're more likely to have a stress dream because your body's like oh no we're on fire we need to wake up so they show mm -hmm. you something scary and then you wake <laughs> up and you're like I have to go to work in the morning. Please don't do that. Uh, it's not my fault. Global warming has made it 110 <laughs> degrees today. <laughs> so it's just, mm -hmm. I just want to, I just want to sleep. <laughs> oh man. Uh, I'm not, not speaking from experience or anything. Um, of course not. No, <laughs> but, <laughs> doesn't sound like it. <laughs> but even the opening scene of the film is a daughter is sitting or a girl, a, whatever the characters are there the daughter and, and nicholas cage her, her father are in the backyard keys fall down uh from the seat from the sky and then nicholas cage just sort of looks up and looks away and the daughter is wondering why like he's not reacting and then somebody falls into the pool from the sky and then eventually the daughter starts to float into the air and like I, even just for myself i'm thinking like oh it's a it's a young daughter she probably wants to learn how to drive she's kind of anxious about it her dad's not very present and doesn't really respond to things that are going on in the world around him. And then she starts to float away because maybe she perceives like, it's not like I matter anyway. And then you have this interaction where like, and then we of course learn more about Paul Matthews where you're like, Oh, I can see where these things are coming from. And <laughs> like, yeah, there's this like sense in which like the film uses when it has these dreamlike sequences to showcase a combination of like things you want that you don't have 
or like a reality you would like to have had or some form of it. Um, but then uh, a, a very important scene that we'll get into, uh, and I hate to keep saying that because it feel like it's like such a faux pas for podcasting, but this movie, like what it wants to talk about also requires getting into more specifics. So I guess we'll do that mm-hmm. probably sooner than later. But the film then really overtly shows a contrast between man's internal desire and reality and how like, even if you try and get all the pieces together, like it just it it isn't that like it, mm-hmm. what you have prescribed as the result is inaccurate you may not know this but the easiest way you can show your support for cinematic doctrine is to rate and review the podcast on itunes spotify or wherever you listen so press pause and share your thoughts we'd love to hear what you have to say and then press play again so you can hear the rest of the show yeah i i also thought a lot about like the biblical expressions of the hubris of man. <laughs> it's kind of what yeah, I would that's call a great it. way to put it. <laughs> Cause like this whole film is like, apart from Paul Matthews character who, yeah, he perceives himself as like less for some reason. And we could probably have reasons, but he perceives himself as that way. And then like having this extreme interest in him uh, bolster his excitement um, to the point that now he is capitulating himself for the, like desires of others it's it it's um it's compelling it's not effective because the movie's not that good (laughs) but but it's definitely compelling so yeah you know what there's more specific things to get into so i think yeah if you're listening and you are i mean neither i mean i well you heard isaac's recommendation it was like if you like nick cage movies or you like weirdo movies if you're a weirdo (laughs) Uh, go check out weirdo, Dream you'll like this movie <laughs> you're gonna have a good time with the dream scenario uh produced by ari aster so you and the 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 parts are there because this movie really does tonally go all over the place i i i step away from not so much recommending the movie i don't i just don't actually think it's that good but i do think it's interesting and so in that regard i soft recommend it there's some i would say vulgar sexuality in the film that is non- uh not nude there's no nudity but it is still like uh a bit <laughs> mm. um but i so if that you know if the film interests you check it out but otherwise we'll we'll get into we'll get into spoilers um <laughs> what um what symbols were you observing iconography motifs what what kind of consistent things were you noticing that the movie was really trying to talk about Hmm. Uh, I mean, just like, obviously we have the whole theme of dreams, you know, and totally. And, and like, we already kind of mentioned uh, like desires, like Paul, this character, uh, has these desires and he feels like he is not adequate enough or whatever. And, you know, is not getting enough from his life currently, and and so i don't know i guess those both play into just the whole whole theme of the movie honestly of of you know all these wonky dreams that everybody is having about him and and how it's kind of like when i remember watching lost and great show like i loved it it's very very famous final episode <laughs> <laughs> very controversial <laughs> this is what it kind of reminds me of it's like we find out that i how, however you want to interpret this like we, we have this like final place mm-hmm. that everybody ends up going to when they die they may have died at who knows when during the season it's very controversial but <laughs> to me i was just like it the unsatisfying portion of the film was the ending where, you know, I don't know. There's this whole wishy-washy of like, how much of this is real? Like the whole dream thing over this, it just, to me, what played into making it a, a tough and not, I wouldn't say it was necessarily a confusing watch, mm-hmm. but definitely, like I said, is out there for people. It's not like something that I would recommend my mom to watch, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, <laughs> this is going to be a harder film 
for casual viewers to watch because of this whole dream uh, motif, I guess, uh, through throughout the movie. So so that I don't know, man, I, in films like that, I'm I'm OK with giving a shot. I'm OK with watching for sure. But I guess I would consider myself on the more casual side of things, um, just being somebody who has not experienced a lot of films um, in general. So um, absolutely willing to try those things out. But um, to me, just that whole wishy-washy dream thing just didn't didn't play to the my strengths as a consumer, I guess. Sure. I, I totally get you. And and I I think in a way you're also selling yourself short because I too, as a big fan of these types of weirdo movies, was also not on the wavelength of this film. <laughs> um, so with spoilers open, just to give some examples uh, in terms of like tone, or I would almost say overreach that the film has. Um, the, the premise and setup is very simple. It's just like simple dreams. And what's happening is he's just appearing in people's dreams. And he just kind of shows up and walks away. There's a pretty funny sequence of just like showing us dream after dream of people in these weird scenarios. And you just have this like, 60 year old bald man show up kind of like, <laughs> mm, and then walk right. away. And like, that's kind of funny, but then like it, it pivots to getting into like, these people are having these nightmares where he like kills them. And then they imply like he's raping them. And it's like, really like they, they, you can see like the past where like, if this was given to a, a more traditional studio, they would say like, you got to take out the part where he says, they say he rapes them in the dreams. Like that would just be like, uh, it's it's just even hearing the word in this film feels so out of place because like all the stuff setting us up didn't feel like it should be there and like then there's like graphic violence in some of the dreams and i i think like the film just sets itself up as so much more accessible and then it starts to do all this but then like mm -hmm. it isn't just in the dreams but like later on he like is trying to go to an event but everyone's having these dreams where they're where he's killing them. So he gets like canceled, which is a whole other thing to talk about because it gets <laughs> this movie gets ridiculous. And like he like tries to get into this room, but the person's trying to keep the door shut. And like he lets go, the door swings shut and it like clips her hand. And so like she's like bleeding profusely from her hand and like the set like design or the, the, the design gives her like essentially like what looks like a squirt gun filled with blood for her hand. <laughs> it's like really graphic. And like, it's super like, like uh, you could say like, Oh, the script said to make it nightmarish and very bizarre. And it's like, yeah, but it, did it help the movie? I don't think so. <laughs> it just it became weird. Yeah. Um, did you find that like a lot of that more let's call it like edgy stuff was just almost like perturbing, like frustrating to me? Uh, so that kind of stuff doesn't necessarily bother me as a viewer. And I think it was a little jarring for sure, because it didn't seem to flow with the rest of the disturbing events that had happened up to that point. Mm -hmm. Like that was definitely a point that was like, Oh, okay. I guess we're yeah. going all in on the <laughs> trying to disturb the audience type of thing. But uh, yeah, it was, it was very interesting. I don't know if I would um, say that it, it really derailed the, the film for me, uh, but it's certainly, kind of opened up the back half of that movie to like you said it kind of does go off the rails a little bit and that's that starting point of mm -hmm. like oh man now everything's just crazy um and then ultimately just ends pretty much <laughs> yeah in the middle yep. of that and you're just like <laughs> what Oh, the okay. movie's over, I guess. All I right, guess it's guess over. Go home. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, the, the movie went, oh, man, we got a runtime. I got to get out of here. I got a reservation <laughs> yeah. to get to. It's like, geez, Louise, come on. Yeah. Enjoying this episode? Grab that share link and tell your friends. Word of mouth is the most effective way for a podcast to reach new listeners. So don't be shy. Share the episode wherever you can. Yeah, and this is all like like dreams are bizarre and weird. And I I think like there's a space for a movie that's about dreams or about stuff like this maybe having like vulgarity or having stuff that pushes the boundary because dreams do that. Like 
your desires are expressed in abstract ways. And sometimes those desires are stupendously heinous to the point that sometimes people wake up and I've heard people say they felt like they sinned because they dreamed a certain thing. Mm, and true. my, my interpretation preference is that like that was not obligated. It may be indications of sins that you are pursuing or anxious about or ashamed of. But I, I think there's a separation of, of, action taking place because it's in a dream. And one of the big things here in the film too, that I think they make effectively clear is that like what happens in dreams isn't really taking place, but then like later in the film and I semi agree with, so Paul Matthews starts falling apart because like people are like afraid of him. He's, he's getting fired. He can't go places because like they're afraid of him because of what's happening in the dreams because he's how he, his perception of him in the dreams is affecting it. It's hard to explain. So he's getting mad and he's frustrated. And like, this is a long part of the movie. It's like 30 minutes of like different scenes of this happening. And I even saw online people being like, I'm not really sure what the movie's trying to say about dreams here, culture here, possibly even cancel culture, which had by this point felt so like stale to kind of yeah. get into. Then, yeah, like, it just, I think that just, I think there's just a disconnect is what I'm kind of getting into because mm. like my favorite scene in the film, my favorite scene in the film is probably the most vulgar. There's, um, there's this part of the film where he runs into somebody. So the whole film, he's running into people who are having dreams of him that are just boring. Like he just shows up and he leaves, but then he runs into like a young call, it like 23 year old woman. She's an intern who's just like, Oh, like in the dream, we just have sex. And like, he's just like weirded out by that. But you can understand the curiosity, both one as an older man uh, who looks at himself less and is unhappy in his life, which is all bad stuff. Um, not, I, he should get help for that. But then what he's now doing is bad stuff. Um, and then the interest in sleeping with this girl, because that's been her desire or dream and in the dream, he's like, okay, maybe I'll do this. So he goes out to dinner and then finally she tells him the dream and it's like he's creeping in the room beside her. She's terrified of him. Then he sits next to her and then they he like becomes assertive is how I'll describe it. And I want to be careful for listeners because, you know, I, I don't even have an interest in ex describing anything explicit here, but it's also not very explicit in the film. It's just vulgar. Um, and then what happens is the girl, Molly, she's like, I want to recreate the dream. And like, I think what I found compelling about the scene is just that that's kind of what Paul Matthews is trying to do is he's trying to create and capture his desires and reality of being important. Um, mm -hmm. One character, Michael Sarah, just straight up says, you're the most interesting person on the planet. And that immediately makes Paul happy. Right. Um, and so like for this person to then want to do the same, which is I want to recreate this dream that I like having, they then try and do it. And it's a disaster. It's just the worst. And like, it's all great until it's not like the scene. I mean, because I really didn't like how it end ended. <laughs> but I appreciated that, like, it was awkward. It wasn't titillating. It was embarrassing to watch. And like, it was just like, just awful. So I guess as I'm setting this up, what did you think of this uh, as I titled it, the recreating a sexual fantasy scene. I, I love that you say this is your favorite scene. Of the movie. It's not like the movie gave me a lot to like. So I'm just. Yeah, no, but you're totally right about like it was like an embarrassing scene. Like I love The Office, like rewatch it probably once every other year or something like that. But there are probably two or three episodes that I am literally watching <laughs> with my hands over my face Scott's you you tots. You, Scott's tots <laughs> and dinner party dinner those party. two episodes i'm like watching <laughs> through my hands as because it's embarrassing to watch like you are just ashamed of michael ashamed of even watching the show <laughs> at that point like <laughs> Great you know stuff. it's it is it's tough to watch but you're right like during that scene that's how i felt i was like whoa i am really not comfortable right now with yeah. how this is how all this is playing out but 
it showed, I mean, exactly what would have happened. You know, a, a lot of these, and, and I think we're going away from that as in like movie culture in general, but like you just have the movie um, scenario where everything goes perfectly and everything is so romantic and everything is, you yeah. know, just perfect. And this is the opposite of that. Everything goes Completely. horribly. Uh, he is <laughs> extremely embarrassed at the, at the end of the scene. And it's just like, yeah, I appreciate how real and honest that scene is <laughs> despite me watching it through my hands. <laughs> yeah, despite having to suffer through the experience of watching that <laughs> yes, scene. Exactly. Frankly, it's like as a short film, I feel like it's a great example of like the the scene as a short film is like a great example of I don't know, put it on a VHS tape and call it a PSA called Why Not to Have an Affair. <laughs> like <laughs> it is you like you 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 sh- essentially see like Affairs are entirely predicated on fantasy. Uh, dreams, of course, are predicated on fantasy. But sure. like giving into sin, even sin itself is like this fantasy of reality that is ultimately untrue. And like what I found so compelling in the scene is it was willing to put these characters in a place where they were perpetually chasing the desire and the dream. But every single instance, they kept running into the fact that they're two different people. So they have completely two different lives and different interests. Who's to say they even, if they were married, would have the same sexual interests? Like, like there's just so much that's incorrect that like when they're trying to like, so at one point, like he sits down, this is in real life. He sits down next to her and he's like, what do I do? And then she's just like, well, in the dream, you're like, you kind of take charge. And like she says that, and the audience is like, Paul Matthews never takes charge. <laughs> like, you <laughs> that's know, that that's just never going to happen. <laughs> and like, there's, there's something so um, honest about that, that to me that I just found so frankly, quite beautiful. And that's what frustrated me mm-hmm. that like the scene ends in trying to be kind of funny, awkward when like, I actually thought it worked as like this really heartbreaking showcase yeah. of True. how delusional like you can become when you have completely given given way to sin itself and just tried to like chase your desires and yeah like I, to me like when i watched the rest of the movie and then saw that it decided not to be grounded like that where it was constantly challenging itself because like right after this is right pretty much when people start getting killed in their dreams or abused the movie just goes completely like away from that grounded experience of like showing us essentially various ways in which Paul is delusional. Then it just becomes like a, yeah, different movie. So I, I I found that really, I found that disappointing because I felt like this movie had some of just a really interesting way to showcase desires manifested and then an interesting way to deconstruct them. Um, in a way that I think is quite relatable because as stated earlier, dreams are vulgar and vile. I, I I also love the scene. Um, uh, first off the wife character is great. We haven't even talked about her, Mm -hmm. but like there's a scene where like, he's talking about how he's in all these other people's dreams and he asks his wife, am I in your dream? She's like, not, no, (laughs) I don't know why. And, and then she's just like, he he says something like, don't you ever fantasize about me or do you fan of, are you fantasizing about other men? And she's like, I don't know. Are you fantasizing about other women? And then he's like the actual moment of strength he has is when he goes, I, I actually do, but I don't, I don't give into affairs, which of course is foreshadowing. We know what's going to mm-hmm. happen, but right. like, um, it's, I just, I wanted more of that. <laughs> I don't know if you kind of felt right. that, but I, I wanted more of that. Hey there, listener. Want to influence the podcast? Head on over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine and support the show for $3 a month. In doing so, you'll be able to vote on a movie poll that picks a film we discuss each month. So jump on over there and have your voice heard. Yeah, it it definitely there is those moments of of honesty and just realism, I guess, when you don't get a lot of that in in some movies that you know are trying to portray this like perfect image 
of relationships or or whatnot you know like Mm -hmm. no if our relationship is perfect obviously i don't ever fantasize about other people or other relationships or anything like that but yeah like it gets down to being real and honest and you're like well yes i do but i don't act on those on those things so i Mm -hmm. i agree with you there and then when we get that flip of just you know we're the movie kind of goes bonkers and just flips from the grounded realism with the touch of crazy Mm -hmm. to all the crazy without too much realism (laughs) in the the last part of the movie to people having dream bands they can (laughs) just teleport into your dreams and market products really yeah (laughs) that's when it lost quite quite interesting (laughs) i was like i can't quite interesting at the end of the movie man it just I'm not a script writer, so I, I can't tell them how they should have ended that movie to make it a satisfying and, and well done movie. But when 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 you go off the rails, I think that was still OK. But I think you're you mentioned that, too, when you get to the the part where they're literally going into other people's dreams, then it was like. Wait a minute. What, <laughs> what, yeah. what is this what movie about heck? again? <laughs> what are we doing here? Like, like the movie's more about like dreams, self-perception, as you mentioned earlier, um, and like desires. But then like that thing, the dream band where you can go in and market to people's brains. That's not about people. That's about ca- like capitalism. <laughs> that's like, right. that's not the same topic. <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah, what is the thesis exactly. statement of your movie? Like you could have taken 15 minutes out or something like that. Mm-hmm. But they, but they wanted a scene where he can go into someone's dream with intent uh, and do some work for it. Um, some, one of the other things I saw a lot in the film too, were um, uh, with perception being present was just, there was a ton of shots with mirrors that f- frankly were not utilized too well. In fact, sometimes I was just confused why they were there like, or why the, the editing and framing shot it in such a way. Um, and the only understanding I could come up with in my mind was they had to fit it in. So it just kind of awkwardly, this mirror is like in a shot or this, that, whatever. Mm. I was just thinking like, because the film is a bit about how a bit, because the film is a lot about how Paul Matthews (laughs) sees himself uh, and wishes to see himself. I just thought that the motif of mirrors, although clunky, I thought was effective just because although I can look in a mirror and do my hair in the morning, like I will literally, literally never see myself perfectly. Um, I can never really see myself for who I am. I can know who I am. Uh, I can feel where I am in space and time. As long as my inner ear is at the right level, (laughs) Um, (laughs) I'm not too dizzy, but like, I can't quite capture that. So I guess like, I'm curious, like, uh, so we see how this character tries to resolve it, right? He He's going and he's seeing how he's seen by others and he's trying to control it or understand it. How do you kind of process that as like a motif in the film? And then how do you, how do you deal with self-perception? Hmm. <laughs> getting to the big stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're getting into the real topics here. Uh, yeah, I think that's, I, and that's something that I didn't notice throughout the film like their their use of mirrors but that's a great point about how paul matthews probably looked in the mirror every day and hated what he saw Mm -hmm. uh he he didn't like who he was he wanted to be more popular he wanted to be more important he wanted Mm -hmm. other people to think he was more important as as you know that's kind of the where where it gets into the self-perception thing um he he just had this need to be important. And, and that's, that's a cool, you know, thought of like the mirror kind of just shows that he's probably, you know, every time he looks at himself, he's thinking that, and that really does not change throughout Mm -hmm. the movie necessarily. Even when he's on his upswing and his fame, uh, he still looks in the mirror and thinks like, yeah, I, I think, I want to be more important. Like he's striving to write this book that they don't (laughs) want. Nobody wants this book, but he really wants to write this book. Mm -hmm. So people 
can read it and, and, you know, see who he really is and see how important he is. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's an interesting, uh, point about the mirrors, but self-perception wise, there's, there's a lot to talk about in this movie because he, Paul Matthews is just, when it comes down to it, he's, he's all of us. He's, we're all Mm -hmm. looking to, you know, see, um, ourselves in a positive light in other people's minds, right? Like we're all trying to be accepted. We're all trying to be important, uh, in the people around us. Now he takes it to a pretty severe extreme <laughs> that most people would not, yes. <laughs> but, but at, at its core, at its base, I mean, we, as just humans, as selfish humans, that's just part of our nature is we want to be, felt feel seen and and needed and important in in the people around us so when when he (laughs) has those needs and he strives and strives and works so hard Mm -hmm. to you know uh eventually act on those um it just and that's when it blows up on him you know and that's where i kind of made that parallel to ecclesiastes uh, where it's like, man, and, and he never, to be fair, he never really fully uh, sees his desires come to pass. Like it kind of yes. like he's grabbing at it, he's grabbing at it, but it never, he never actually is able to grab onto it before he comes crashing down. Yeah, they're all, they're all monkey paws. Yes, yeah. exactly. Whereas Solomon, the writer of Ecclesiastes, he reached the top. He was there. Literally he, there. He has yes. the peak of everything and he saw it's all vanity. Like mm-hmm. nothing really is going to give you satisfaction in this life. Paul, unfortunately, does not have the clarity to see that. So he continues yeah. to strive to be important in other people's minds throughout the movie up until the very last scene. Literally. Just, you know, <laughs> yeah. Ugh, just, yeah, it's uh it's, it's a, has a lot to say about how you perceive yourself and how Paul specifically perceives himself. Yeah. And I kept the, uh... Uh, drawing on the wife as a character, I kept thinking of um, how just she's very patient with him. She's interested with him. And uh, there was a line, I wrote it down in my notes when I was watching. It was really, I really liked it. Where was it? He just, he's like on the phone with his wife. And I think it's just after he had this meeting uh, with Michael Sarah. Michael Sarah runs like a company. They're going to take him as a client to get him to do partnerships and you know, marketing, stuff like that. And that's when Michael Sarah says, I think you of you as the most interesting person in the world, which is like for Paul is like the, that's the Mm -hmm. best thing he's heard in his entire life since the birth of his two children. So like he's maybe, maybe even better (laughs) from his perspective. And so he's like calling his wife and he's having this conversation with her, trying to tell her like how, like he's going to maybe have a partnership with Sprite. And maybe try and get to be in Barack Obama's dreams and like uh, all that stuff. (laughs) And then like his wife just says like, you don't have to impress me, Paul. I love you. (laughs) And like, (laughs) It's just this really sweet like response back that's very gentle because it's like a, you know, she's pushing back against what he's doing. Mm -hmm. But then also extremely kind to just say like, you're in my life. I chose to have you be this close to me and I want you to be there and I want to care for you and that kind of thing. And um, yeah, you're, you're drawing on Solomon with Ecclesiastes and like, yeah, all of this world and all of like the wealth or joy, perceived joy you can amass in its materials or even like perception, it's vanity even when you have it all. And it also means you can lose it all. <laughs> and <laughs> I think, although I didn't like how the movie was ending, I think I, it's clicking for me that like, he is completely at, at odds or pardon, not at odds. What's the word? He He's completely dependent. He's, he's codependent. It was earlier in my notes. There we go. He's completely codependent on the opinions of other people. Hmm. And that means when they turn on him, he, he is 
completely stuck with that. And he's continuing to try to control it. So at the end, he's like wanting to still be allowed to go out and read a book at a cafe. But everyone's had dreams where he's a horrible person. So they're (laughs) terrified of him. They're like, you need to leave or they're spitting in his food. And it's just, it's, it's ridiculous. But like, he is suffering the fact that like, all these people who were now focusing on him have now interpreted him as they interpret him. Um, And just from my own experience within the last, uh, I don't know, undisclosed amount of time, (laughs) I've experienced what it's like to be like mischaracterized in a way that just feels so, because he is in a way being mischaracterized, but the movie's not about what he's actually Mm -hmm. done. It's about his perception and desires. Sure. What it's like to be mischaracterized is just awful. And it's really hard to pull away from that, to like really get away from like what people say about you, good or bad, especially if it's good, because it's easy to give into that. But if they can say good things and you're dependent on that, then you're going to feel really bad when they say bad things. Uh, Yeah, it is uh, not to get the all Jesus on everybody, which I (laughs) probably would like to do more often, but it is really amazing how in Christ, like there's something we can just focus on singularly christ god trinity Mm. and just be there and like because of what christ has done i'm loved i'm cared for and no one's gonna just like swap like in dream scenario and change their mind like that (laughs) yeah fingers crossed uh (laughs) i know it's not fingers crossed just read the bible Um, (laughs) (laughs) hey listener we've got a mailbag now Open those show notes, scroll down a little, and you'll see a mailbag link. Press it and send us a text with a question and your first name, and we'll answer it in a future episode. So if any questions pop up while you're listening to the rest of this episode, you know what to do. We'd love to hear from you. With the ending, um, which I think will be the bulk of where we go, because so much of the discussion is really made in the ending here, just to describe the ending for the listener who decided to listen to the full episode and hasn't seen the movie. Paul Matthews, by this point, he's been in everybody's dreams. He had his meteoric rise, then all the dreams, he starts being violent. And he's not doing this by choice, by the way. These things just happen. Um, So the dreams start happening. Everyone rejects him. He loses his job. Um, He, But he starts reacting so vindictively because he's like, that's not me. And so he's now trying to control his perception. He's trying to keep, like, to fix that. Um, He injures that woman at the thing, which then becomes a public statement saying, the man you've dreamt about, it turns out your dreams are right. He's a violent man. So he just loses everything. Uh, Michael Sarah um, must have been being honest when he said he was the most interesting man, or Paul Matthews is his only client. <laughs> and so <laughs> they continue to work together. Um, there is a funny gag where they're like, uh, well, uh, the, the alt right starts starting to like you now that you're violent. So, which I thought was pretty funny. Um, they're like, we can get you on Tucker Carlson. <laughs> he's like, I don't want to be on Tucker Carlson. Uh, that was good stuff. That was good. So now he's got his book out, and it's a disaster. It's not what he wanted. He, and there's this dream device. So he buys the dream device, which lets you go into other people's dreams if you try hard enough. And the ending is a callback to a conversation he had with his wife, where his wife finally said, if you were in my dream, I'd want you to wear that Talking Heads costume you wore a couple years ago. You'd save me from a burning fire, and then we'd spend time together. And so while he had joked around and said, that's a silly dream, you could fantasize about anything, and that's what you want. In this moment, he puts the dream device on, he tries to reach through space and time and go into his wife's dream, and he does. And he is in the talking head suit. You know the one. Uh, It's the one Kermit wears. Um, And then he (laughs) saves his wife, like Joan of Arc, from the burning fire. They go for a walk. They hug and they kiss. He says, I wish this was real. And he floats into the sky. Credits roll. How how did you think of this? What did you think of this ending? It was something. (laughs) (laughs) Like, I think we've already talked about, you know, how how this movie progresses Mm -hmm. and you know when when you hit that point where there is that product basically that they're pushing that you can go into other people's dreams and then it was like i think we've lost the premise of this movie yeah (laughs) at this point Mm -hmm. so anything after that point is just like 
I don't even, I don't even. It's know like an SNL what's skit. going on. Yeah, yeah, it really is. It really is. And and to go from a at least partially, I mean, this movie does have comedic elements throughout. You know, even yes. from from the very beginning. So I'm not saying that you know it it all of a sudden changes and all of a sudden gets super you know comedic mm-hmm. or whatever. Parts are funny. Yeah, parts are funny. Uh, but there is that moment that it flips, and then you're just like man, this feels like almost a different movie. Uh, and, and then yeah. it just kind of ends. And you're just like, <laughs> it's kind of left sitting there like, wow, okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't yeah. really know what to think about this movie anymore. Like if if it had ended prior to that, or like, again, I said, I'm not a script writer. If they had some <laughs> different scenario that ended this film. A waking nightmare scenario as opposed to a, <laughs> a dream, dream scenario. Scenario. <laughs> <laughs> I might have had a much higher perspective mm-hmm. of this film. But yeah, it just kind of ends and you're left kind of wondering what what was this movie about? <laughs> yeah. It started out really well and in a great direction. And then it just kind of loses its steam a little bit by the end and And kind of just ends. You hate to say it about a movie that's like uh, less than a year old, Hmm. but it's a movie prime for a remake. Like it is (laughs) like there is so many interesting ideas here. But then this is and, and even where this scene is, this ending scene is kind of beautiful as like a, you know, a tragic moment. This character who we've watched rise and fall and he's always been kind of this way. It's just the events of the film heightened and hyperbolized and, and raise the tension and stress of the scenarios. So now his, his true colors are revealed, so to speak. And the tragedy of the ending is he throughout the whole film, he was living in other people's dreams as a passerby. And then he continued in his real life to do so. Even in his own life, he was essentially the side character of his own story. And then he gets to the end and he's doing the same thing. He's now manually putting himself into other people's dreams. And although he can now make decisions and actions like wearing the talking head suit, maybe, maybe he made that decision if, if he actually did go in his wife's dream. Um, <laughs> that like he's now going to be making decisions in dreams which do not have results. <laughs> if I were to get a million dollars tonight in my dream – I will still wake up with what is in my bank account. (laughs) And so like, it just Mm -hmm. doesn't like the tragedy is there and it's, and and, like the, the scene is good, but the process to it is very weird and very um, uh, off from the rest of the material. Cause it is like an interesting way of showing like he's, this whole dream sequence evokes like a, a moment of kind intimacy with his wife that was uh, disrupted by like an invader in the house. But it was like a moment of intimacy and sweet romance between this married couple that's been together for 15 years, has two kids. They're successful. They're, they're, they're living the American dream. And like, then like he's dreaming about that time that was just right. Um, the, one of the best lines is the office is when Andy's like, I wish you could know you were in the, what is it? The golden days or better days. Yeah. When, no golden days is when you're good old. old days, the good old days yeah. when you were in the gold, old, good, when you are actually in the good old days. And so like that tragedy is there and to keep from, you know, beating a dead horse, it's the pieces getting to it, just make it not work. But I, I do kind of find the ending compelling. And as stated at the very start, it's super interesting. It's just in the wrong movie. (laughs) And that to me is just Mm -hmm. almost like the worst crime that happens where like that scene, uh, the sexual fantasy scene, and then like the, the, the married couple talking and being honest with each other. Those pieces are like better than the rest of the material. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's yeah. almost it, it is frustrating, frankly. I, I I am almost like, apart from the fact that it is probably like eighty degrees in my apartment right now because the air conditioning's <laughs> off. I'm almost I'm like hot. I'm like I feel frustrated at this movie because of that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I no, I I <laughs> like that point that you made though because there is there is actually I I don't even want to call it an an a little 
snippet of closure because it doesn't feel satisfying as an ending. Yeah, but it doesn't. There yeah. is there is an element of, you know, like you were saying, of intimacy and positive intimacy between him and his ex-wife in that moment. But then, like you said, I mean, it's still a dream. So he's going to wake up and be in this apartment alone yeah. somewhere. And it was all a dream. <laughs> so he's right back in that same place. Uh, this movie does a really good job at right before he kind of go. The movie goes off the rails. It makes you feel sympathetic for for mm-hmm. Paul because you I mean, we mentioned it before. He does not really deserve all of the hate yes. that he is receiving in public. And he he is a little bit stubborn and does not handle it very well. But you feel sympathy for him because this all of this stuff is what people are perceiving about him. That's not actually true. Right. He I mean, up until he actually slams somebody's fingers to the door, he's not a violent person. Right. He he you know, he has never done anything like that before in his life. But people unfairly cancel him or however you want to want to say it. And I like in this ending scene that he finally comes to a moment of, hey, I guess I was wrong because it took him way too long to come to that point. Yes. He he holds on to the I'm the victim mentality for a very, very long time, more more than the average person would or should (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah so that's what another part of what makes this ending a little bit just unsatisfactory this realization from him should have probably come sooner and sure at least he comes to somewhat of one at some point in the movie but again it's not even a real one like it's in her dream so yeah You know, what it comes down to is, did he learn his lesson? Yes, question mark. (laughs) He's still not confronting it in a way that is going to be beneficial to him in his real life. Yes. And or even in hers, because like, he is he by learning what her fantasy was, even if it's a joke, he then has the opportunity in the real world to like make a romantic gesture by just doing the fantasy, but in the real world. Mm. And like, that would be loving. That would be kind. And it would also be a capitulation of his self image, which he refuses to loosen um, throughout the film. At the start of the film, he feels like he has no power over it. And I do think at the end of the film, at the very least in the dream world, kind of asserts that he does and how always has had power. He can say no. He can say to Mo- to Molly during the affair scene, I'm not doing this. I'm married. <laughs> but he just says, you know, I'm a married man, as if to say he wants her to deny him. Right. But it's like, no, he needs to recognize, like, I am in control of who I am. I am in control of my, my own desires or what I do with them, I should say. Because, you know, I've said it before on the podcast, you don't decide what food you like until you have it but you could decide what you're going to eat. (laughs) So like (laughs) there is a point though, where you have to um, have some self-control and it's a film wherein he like completely indulges. And this ending scene, I think it just feels incomplete because we don't get the scenes at the end where he perhaps struggles with giving himself up, but it wants to be a tragedy. I just don't think it spends enough time getting there, like exploring that. I, I, mm-hmm. I keep thinking, I keep thinking in this discussion, we, there's an episode, I guess it's already out by now, by the time this goes up, where we talk briefly about Jesus revolution. And I said, the best part I liked about that movie is that the conversion happened halfway into the film so mm-hmm. that the rest of the movie, the character is like dealing with what it's like to kind of be a new convert and how kind of confusing and uh, zealous it is, but also kind of dreadful and also really, really hard. And I was like, that was so much better than watching Kevin Sorbo get hit by a car and converting before he <laughs> dies in two minutes. Uh, it's just like, it just means so much more to watch people grow. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, yeah, I think, I think that might be a bit of what we're feeling. We're like, because we just see him be, be kind of like i 
I don't mind a movie where someone's miserable the whole time or someone's awful. Um, sometimes it feels great to feel spend time with villains, but it, it has to have something more. Uh, and this one just kind of, I feel like the ending shows it doesn't. And then of course mm. the credits show it absolutely does not. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Want some quick updates on the podcast? Follow the Cinematic Doctrine Instagram for cool posts and story updates. Press the link in the show notes or search Cinematic Doctrine, that's one word, in your Instagram app. Oh, and we're on threads. Check us out there, too. I I would say, though, like, you know, all in all, uh, I think the movie, uh, if calling back to before we transitioned into spoilers, I think the movie's not great but i think it's really interesting so if any of this has sounded interesting and you want to at least have something interesting to talk about listener or maybe with people like who also like weird movies this one's kind of worth checking out but it is frustrating and i think that as you're watching it you'll be script doctoring it and also very embarrassed don't watch it with your mother just watch it by yourself <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. so good tip but yeah uh any any what what do you think do you how do you with spoilers open do you recommend yeah. it do you not how do you think about it i i think i feel about this i'd say probably a step above interesting i found mm-hmm. it the concepts and the ideas in this movie i found them fascinating mm-hmm. but the execution left maybe a little bit to be desired. I still think like you mentioned, the performances are great in this film and that makes it much better than a lot of Nicolas Cage films that, uh, (laughs) that I have (laughs) had the opportunity to watch. Mm -hmm. Uh, So in that sense alone, as a, as a film, I I think it's worth a watch. It's not one that I would rewatch a whole lot. Yeah. Uh, But again, this is not something that I would recommend to my mom or to somebody who is not a big movie watcher. Whose mom would you recommend it to? <laughs> That's a great question. Maybe Nicolas Cage's mom, maybe. <laughs> but uh yeah, it was uh it's it's interesting. It has a lot of great concepts. Just a little too weird to be yeah. great in my opinion. Been itching for a Cinematic Doctrine merch? Check out the support tiers on Patreon. We're offering merch to those who support at select tiers. So head on over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine and share your support. There's a link in the show notes too. What do you, what do you recommend to the listeners? I I mentioned earlier that I don't get to go to the movie theater very often. And if I do most of the time, it's with my kids to a, a kid's movie, but my wife and I, my wife is a huge Twister fan, and we just got the opportunity to go to Twisters last week. And if you're looking for a solid summer blockbuster and you like the original Twister film, Twisters is, is a good one mm-hmm. to go to. It was it was a lot of fun. They had some really great um, disaster uh, like scenes, like scenarios in that film. Glenn Powell is just great and everything i I, he's really i love his meteoric rise in in acting right now he's he's in a lot of great stuff and he's just fun he's just fun to watch and i am not recalling the main actress in this film right now but she did a fantastic job great performances all around it's a it's a fun one and i twister to me this is another we mentioned on the patreon version i'm not a huge fan of all these like reboots and sequels and things that are coming out. Mm-hmm. When I heard they were doing a twister sequel, I was like, why? What <laughs> the, the first movie is perfect. Why do we need a sequel? <laughs> like what? There's absolutely no reason that we need a sequel for this, but because of my wife and my love for the original, we're like, okay, well we at least have to go check it out and, and you know, watch it before we decide it's a stupid idea (laughs) so so we did and it was it was fun it was good and you can't compare it to the original because in my mind twister is a cinematic masterpiece that i mean that's like a top 20 all-time film to me i 
absolutely loved that movie. So I, I wasn't, I didn't go into this expecting a, you know, a, a cinematic masterpiece necessarily, but it was, it was really fun. Absolutely worth checking out if you're into the, the summer blockbuster scene. Uh, so I was going to search to see if I had a movie to recommend. Like I mentioned earlier, I think in the Patreon thing, I saw Long Legs, but it was all right. Um, and that's coming from a big stand for Black Coat's Daughter. I love that movie, uh, mm-hmm. as listeners know. Go back and listen to the old episode on that. Um, and all the other stuff that I've seen that I th- found interesting, I've already actually recommended on the podcast. So I was going to break break from the norm for a second, recommend... <gasps> a mobile game that I've been playing a lot of lately called Godzilla Battle Line. Uh, It is not as... It's actually just really not that predatory when it comes to pricing, which is a horrible thing to have to say about anything. Um, but <laughs> not really, that predatory. Yeah, this game um, they give you a lot of units to use. Basically, it's you you pick a leader, your opponent picks a leader, and then you get uh, seven other units, and you get energy over time. And you place the units; they cost energy. They fight whatever. And just like any other battle type arena game, there's normal things like stuns there's slowdown effects transporting blinking why area aoe attacks whatever and uh it, i find it really fun i found it a lot deeper too in gameplay than i was expecting it to be when i first started it um it has godzilla characters from all over all over various eras it has a couple partnerships there's i think some neon genesis characters that are in there which are pretty cool i don't know how to get them so i guess i gotta wait for an event um but uh but they are from the rebuilds i do not like those but um but the characters are all really cool and it's getting me excited to watch some other godzilla uh movies because i've just been more interested in kaiju films lately um yeah i I find it really fun it has events pretty frequently um and some of these units are just i don't know it's also just really cool so i don't know how else to pitch a mobile game (laughs) um but like that's all i could say it's just extremely fun and like you get a lot of units like just the first three days i was playing i basically had the deck i was using for like a month or two and like and that wasn't luck it was just like i looked up a tier list online it was like oh these one star guys they're great (laughs) okay cool i'll take it so yeah godzilla battle line totally free check it out it's pretty fun Isaac, thank you so much for coming on this episode and doing it with me. Uh, Tell people where they can find you. Yeah, thank you. It has been a pleasure to... I I generally don't get to talk about Nicolas Cage movies on our podcast because I'm like the only (laughs) one that watches them. So (laughs) so it's nice to be able to to talk to somebody about that. So yeah, it's been been a blast. But you can check out The Infinity Rose at theinfinityrose.com. We're across all social media. Uh, frequently posting videos on TikTok and Instagram. Um, and uh, Robbie, one of our co-hosts, also does Drip, which is like a a whatnot type site where you can buy Magic the Gathering packs from him and basically get them shipped to your doorstep. So it's, it's kind of a cool, cool, unique thing. Um, and, you know, that, that if you're into Magic the Gathering... That's that's where everybody's at, man. Whatnot and Drip are really cool sites for people that are at home, don't necessarily are not able to make it to the store to get their you know magic stuff. Um, so that's that's where Robbie's at. But me specifically, I hang out on X a lot, and uh, my now threads actually threads has become my my next biggest social media because people are just positive on threads Mm -hmm. so check out the infinity bros on either of those platforms and you can you can hang out with me and chat with me about movies thanks so much for checking out this episode of cinematic doctrine if you enjoyed this episode consider leaving a review and subscribing to the podcast And as mentioned before, Cinematic Doctrine has a Patreon. For as little as $3 a month, you're opted into a once a month movie poll where you decide a movie we discuss on the podcast. There are other unique benefits that come with supporting the podcast, so be sure to check that out at patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine. 
A special shout out to those who support at the Art House Theater tier on Patreon. Thank you so much, Mom, Dad, Melanie, Sherlyon, and Thomas. You guys are the best, and your continued monetary support is greatly appreciated. Until next time, stay cool. Want some Cinematic Doctrine swag? You're in luck. We've got 3-inch Cinematic Doctrine logo stickers exclusive for Patreon supporters. Perfect for your travel mug or laptop. Head over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine, link in the show notes, and choose the independent theater tier. Doing so will net you other perks too. But let's be real, the podcast stickers are the coolest perk. So get yourself some podcast stickers by supporting on Patreon.